Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors Workshop Series on Company Audit, Tax and Employee Compliance in China. Have you developed corporate governance in your China company? Do you have control over your China organization? Do you have preventative measures against fraud? Are you aware that a China company must perform a year-end audit and complete annual compliance filings? Are you familiar with the various deadlines of these annual compliance procedures? And do you know how to implement these functions within your organization? At Woodburn Accountants and Advisors, we are offering this workshop series in order to be able to enrich your business skills and enhance your China market entry efforts. Today, you have joined us for part two of this webinar workshop series on individual and corporate risks and precautions for foreign investors in China. Is your corporate structure stable in China? Are you having turnover amongst board members, legal reps, or general managers? Have you ever had a bad member in your corporate structure? Have you had individuals steal your company chops and other business licenses? Have you experienced nightmare terminations? Well, if you have, then this webinar workshop today will guide you out of these frustrations. So what are we covering today? Today we're going to be covering what is the corporate structure, why is the corporate structure important, what is the role, responsibility, and liability of a legal representative, the importance of CHOP control, how to terminate individuals in the corporate structure, and proven strategies for appointing individuals within the corporate structure. Now, how this process works, or how I work in terms of these webinar series, is I teach. And I sometimes ask you questions. Please answer them in the chat box. It allows me to understand who you are, what your pain points might be in relation to China. You can ask any questions at any point during the presentation. I will answer them. We will stay on until every question is answered. So ultimately, what I want you to know is that you will have a valuable spend of your time during this workshop. So please do take advantage of this time. Um, you may want to avoid distractions, so you, wanna may, you may wish to remove your phone, grab yourselves a pen and paper so you can take notes, but please do interact with me. So in order to start today's presentation, um, you know, my biggest question is, why should you be concerned by individual and corporate risks within your company? And I'm going to start off today with case studies. Generally speaking, most, most companies and people, when they join these webinar sessions, they like to hear about the cases that have occurred, especially the bad ones. So let me start off with the first case study today, which was something that was um, very surprising as it happened. Um, it, it's probably the one case where, you know, um, you may think that I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, dramatizing it a little bit too much, but uh, in reality it happened and it does happen with other organizations as well. So we had a client, it was a small SME out of Canada. Um, they had incorporated their company in China and literally within the first two years of operating in China, without having calculated this into their budget, they spent over 80,000 RMB in lawyer's fees just to change the internal corporate structure of their Chinese entity. And the reason behind this was the fact that there were continuous regulations on C-level positions in the headquarter, which eventually then caused disruption with the China company. So they hadn't calculated the 80,000 RMB um, in legal fees. They certainly hadn't thought about all of these resignations. But as I was suggesting to them to have a cleaner and more transparent um, corporate structure, they kept saying, no, 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 we want to keep involving our team and our staff, but without realizing that there were issues already in the headquarter concerning, concerning, concerning the C-level positions. So be aware of who you're appointing. Are they the right people? Are there issues with those people in your headquarters? It's, it's very important to find this out right straight from the start. The second case study is terminating individuals within the corporate structure. So in this case, and it, you know, in retrospect, it's quite a, a humorous story. 
Um, we had a client out of Italy. They had been established in China for a number of years. The legal representative was an Italian, having relocated to Shanghai to manage the subsidiary and manage the, the local operation. Um, over a period of time, he was not meeting his KPIs. Um, there was also just a sour uh, relationship developing with the headquarter and the legal rep. And without getting any form of advisory, the Italian headquarter terminated his employment, forgetting that he was appointed as the legal representative and the general manager. And because the termination was poorly done, he lost face. Um, when he asked for compensation, he was not provided it. And, you know, his, his package was already complicated because it was an Italian package. But in the end of the day, when the Italian headquarter finally realized that he had been appointed legal rep, which they realized only when they couldn't do a bank transfer because they needed the legal rep signature and legal rep chop, did they realize he was the appointed legal rep. And it meant that there was a complete blockage at the bank to process any further transactions. When they then asked him to sign termination documents, because this is a problem in China, when you terminate somebody in the corporate structure, you need to have a signed termination letter by the individual that's being terminated. Um, and as a consequence, in this case, he refused to sign anything. Um, now, one of the things that we did try internally, just thinking outside of the box, was we did approach the government uh, MOFCOM and the AIC to say that the legal rep had died. Um, the well, to our to our complete shock and surprise at that time, because this was in the early 2000s, um, the AIC responded saying that we needed to provide the death certificate in order to be able to remove him. So even though we did try to think outside of the box, it was it was impossible because the government bureaus do need to have confirmation and proof of where these individuals are going. So one of the things we do recommend, and I'll be touching on it in today's presentation, is looking at having people that are in the corporate structure signing, uh, at the point of appointment, signing undated termination letters um, just so that the company is safe if there is any sour uh, termination that occurs. The third case study is in relation to finding no replacement for individuals within the corporate structure. So in this situation, we had a client out of the US that had incorporated a subsidiary in Shanghai. The legal representative was the head of Asia Pacific operations. It was a very logical choice. Everything was perfect until basically this individual resigned to join another company. Now, the problem with this U.S. entity was the fact that they could not figure out who to replace him as, as legal rep, because their biggest concern was, we don't want to have individual liability. And no matter what I said around that, they just personally didn't want to take on that responsibility. For a year and a half, this poor individual who had already left the company was still legal representative of this entity. And he kept approaching us because we were his contact. And, you know, has it been changed? Has it been changed? Has it been changed? And eventually at the point of threatening to sue the company after a year and a half, did the, did the company finally take action to replace him? But the key thing is for this poor individual, if anything bad were to have happened within the company, if the company would have been sued, if they would have gone bankrupt, he would have been the first point of call, which meant that in his current new position with his new, with his new company, he may have been put on the blacklist and not been able to travel to China for his role. So, you know, from my perspective, it was very unfair of this US company to place this individual in such a position for a year and a half without taking their own responsibility. And they could have done a lot of things to protect themselves, like getting indemnity insurance, um, but they didn't do so. So it is important to treat your staff fairly, but also from a corporate side, make sure you are prepared in advance um, to know how to get out of some tricky situations. 
Now, most of you are probably thinking, what is a corporate structure in China? And I should have started off with that, but I always like to start off with the case studies to kind of highlight where companies make mistakes, sometimes unintentionally because they've forgotten a lot of things or you know, they don't want to take certain liability themselves. Um, but it just goes to show you know, what they're doing. So what is a corporate structure in China? Um, you can set up two different types of corporate structures depending on how big your team is. Uh, so if you are probably a medium to larger size organization, you would probably use the structure on the left-hand side, which has a board of directors. If you are a much leaner, smaller structure, you'll probably use the structure on the right. Why do I say that? Because the structure on the left requires a board of directors where you need to have a minimum of three people um, and then a supervisor who is separate from that. So that means in total, for the total structure, you would need at least four people. Uh, with the executive director, instead of the board of directors, you need at least two people. So you could have somebody who is the executive director, legal rep, and GM, and then someone separate who is the supervisor. So it really comes down to what type of structure you have, um, whether you have a lean structure or not. So just to go through a bit the criteria of these individuals that are being appointed in the structure. So if we look back um, at the corporate structure, the first thing that you should know is that the shareholder is obviously the entity or individual that is based abroad, okay? Because you're setting up a foreign invested company. Then all the people that are appointed below the shareholder, nobody needs to reside in China, okay? There is no requirement for somebody to be residing in China. Secondly, out of our own recommendation, we always say appoint people that are responsible for the China business. Don't pick people randomly within your organization. Um, and I've had this happen where people have been picked that are not at all associated with the China business, not associated at all with the Asia Pacific business because they think that there will be then less liability for those individuals. It is not true. Liabilities stay the same. But you should have people that are responsible for China and will watch out for China be in these roles. If you take the structure on the left with the board of directors, by default, the chairman of the board will be the legal representative. In most cities, this is a fixed requirement. Um, in some of the tier one cities, it is not a requirement. The board, people on the board don't have to be the legal rep or general manager. However, in general, you will find that the chairman of the board will be the legal rep and most likely also the general manager. Um, on the right-hand side structure, you have um, the executive director where you can have the executive director act as the legal rep as well as act as the general manager. It's just the supervisor in both structures cannot be a member of the board, cannot be the legal rep, and cannot be the general manager. Um, and I'll explain, I'll explain these, I'll explain why. So before we begin, I mean, why am I able to help you? Um, why am I able to help you in certain situations like this? Because I see a lot of companies struggle. And in fact, I recently uh, helped a company out of the UK establish their business. And the business owner of the company, she actually approached me and said, I am very nervous about being an executive director, a legal rep and general manager. What does this actually mean to me as an individual what are my liabilities? What do I have to watch out for? And in this situation, I helped her, I helped to calm her down because she did have anxiety over taking on these roles and not knowing exactly, you know, um, what if she gets in trouble? What happens to her business abroad? So what I want to say is I've had 16 years of experience in corporate services, in compliance in China. Um, I have helped over 500 international companies go into the market, um, develop their market strategy, implemented them, and have helped them grow across the board. So I myself have been an executive director, a legal rep, and a general manager. Um, the difference being that 
physically based in China. So that's probably something compared to her where she was not based in China. But I have the ability to explain to you what your liabilities are, to act as your advisor in terms of what you need to know when you take on certain roles within the organization, what are the worst case scenarios and what are the best case scenarios. Ultimately, it all comes down to efficiency and being practical when these roles are appoint when individuals are appointed in these roles. So I just want to explain that that throughout my experience in China, I've, I've I've seen the worst and I've also seen the best. Um, but I am able to guide you in terms of what you need to know um, to make a proper decision. Um, just a little pointer, um, if you're interested in learning more, um, we always give away free information, free resources, so please do subscribe on our website at woodburnglobal.com or follow us through our LinkedIn page. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel um, if you want to look at other pieces of content. Now, why is this webinar for you? Um, I always kind of split my clients into three categories. Um, one category for me are the newbies. So if you are a newbie, type in newbie in the chat box because that'll give me a bit of an indication of who you are. But newbies are generally those that are um, looking for an opportunity in China. They may have already received a couple of inquiries and they're looking to gain education and understanding on how to protect themselves and their business. Then you've got the startups in China. So these are usually my clients that have been established in China for a period of one to three years. Um, they've been so focused on their court business and without realizing it, they have had hiccups along their journey, um, which have been manageable to solve, but they want to be able to create more compliance procedures internally to make sure they're fully protected. And then you've got the experienced China hands. Um, these are usually companies or individuals that have been, China, in, been in China for over 10, 12, 15 years. Um, and what they're looking for are new and fresh ideas on how to manage um, and operate their businesses in China. If you are in any one of these, if you're a newbie, if you're a startup, if you're experienced China Han, add it in the chat box. Like I said, I always want to know who's participating in these series, um, just so I have a bit more of an understanding and background. Now, how to choose the right individuals within your organization to make sure that you're not incurring a cost of 80,000 RMB, as I mentioned in the previous case study, in terms of changing um, the corporate structure. To give you a bit of background, when you develop your corporate structure, the passport copies and the names of the individuals are put within the government system. So everything is recorded, okay? So if there are changes, it must be updated because everything reflects on the operations. Generally, the legal rep has the full capacity to operate the bank account, probably with some limits of, of authority, but they have access to the account. So if there are any changes, there could eventually be blockages in certain areas of your business, as I mentioned earlier. So how to choose the right individuals. And what I basically outline is ask yourselves the following questions, okay? In terms of the shareholder, do you have a board of directors within the shareholder? And if you do, who is the authorized signatory? Because what you don't want to do when you're, when you're setting up your corporate structure is have a shareholdership where there are five people as board of directors and you need to get signatures from all five. What you want is that the board of directors of the shareholding entity appoint one individual who is responsible and will be the authorized signer for all documentation required for the setup as well as the ongoing maintenance of the entity. It will simplify your structure. The next question is, will you choose a board of directors or an executive director? And now this client that I just recently had, her anxiety was so high and she said, I think I would prefer to have a board of directors so that I'm not the sole individual that's responsible for everything. And I said, that's fine. Walk me through who you think should be appointed in the board of directors. So she said herself, she added then two other individuals, one of whom is based in Australia, so not next door, um, and the other of whom is not actually responsible for the Asia Pacific business at all. 
So I said, well, you know, why would you appoint, want to appoint someone who's in Australia? That out of efficiency reasons might not be the smartest idea. And the person who's based in the UK with you and is not actually responsible for the China business, why would you want him to be part of that structure? He's probably not a decision maker in any shape or form. So as I started walking through with her all of these questions, um, she started realizing that it does make sense that she is the sole person who should be the executive director. Now, walking through all of these questions is a guide for you to know what will fit into your operation, what will be the efficiency like, because if you do make any changes within your entity, change of business scope, change of office, register office address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you um, you do need to know um, you know that these people have to sign documents. They are the you know they are the people where you need this the black ink pen signatures. So if a single piece of paper has to travel all around the world to get all the signatures, you're wasting time and and there's a tremendous lack of efficiency. So you got to know are you going to choose a board of directors? Are you going to choose an executive director? Who's going to act as the legal rep? Who will be the general manager? What are the roles and responsibilities of those people? What authorities do they have? Who is the appointed supervisor? What's his role? Is he going to be an external person or not? Um, you know, then other questions might be, who is the Chinese decision maker? Who is going to run the operation? Who's creating the strategy? Who's creating the business plan? Who's creating the budget? The next question is who's going to create who's going to manage the finances so when you're opening your bank account in china who's going to operate the bank who's going to be the authorized signatory um, if you're doing online transactions who's going to be the one who approves all the payments you might want that individual to be somehow in the corporate structure as well who's going to keep control of the company chops now the company chops is something i'll touch on a bit later but they do have to be on the ground in china so is it going to be an outsourced provider someone internal if they're controlling the chops, which are so significant, do you want them to be in the corporate structure as well? So asking all of these questions will probably help you to filter out who you think will be the appropriate people to appoint within the corporate structure. And again, get an advisor, talk to somebody about what options you have um, so that you can run through and kind of have a, have a sounding board to talk to someone whether what you're planning makes sense uh, right from the beginning. Now, this next slide is um, something that I have learned a lot in China, um, and, and I, I really follow this to heart. Delegating power always requires a degree of trust. So if you were there in yesterday's session, you probably heard my own personal case study um, of a staff member that I terminated that um, because I was I had zero knowledge about how to terminate someone I didn't know about compensation packages uh, she completely took that to leverage and I had to pay an absorbent amount um, to let her go um, so I and I had trusted her I had built a level of trust and loyalty and relationship over eight months which doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it is quite a lot when you're in China. But delegating power always requires a degree of trust, okay? So if you are delegating any form of power to somebody, at least set up a couple of simple measures to make sure that your Chinese subsidiary and the people that are in the corporate structure are not exposed by one individual taking uh, advantage of you, okay? Um, now, in the Western world, uh, most companies that have been established, I'm not talking referencing the startups or the entrepreneurs, but I'm talking about small, medium-sized companies that have been family-owned businesses and have been established for, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Um, you probably have employees in your organization that have been working with you for 20, 25, 30 years, and there is so much trust, there's so much loyalty that delegating activities and responsibilities is so easy for you to do because you know it will get done and you know it will get done well. But don't forget, when you are entering the Chinese market, you are a startup. 
All of my clients that have arrived in China are startups. From my perspective, I really don't care how long you've been established in Europe, in the UK, in the US. It makes no difference to me because when you arrive in China, you are new. Your staff are new. So build trust, build loyalty. It always takes time and delegate over a certain period of time. Don't give the reins free of charge on the first day, okay? You wanna mitigate the risks and you wanna um, make sure you're protected in every possible way. So again, talk to people about how you can do that within your organization. Now, allocating power to the legal representative, this is something that is very serious. So let me start off basically with when is a company liable for the unauthorized actions of a bad legal rep? And there have been plenty of bad legal reps out there who have done things, have misused the company, have misused chops, have done things in bad faith. Well, according to the China contract law, if the legal representative um, of a company creates a contract in excess of its authority limits, such representative's action is valid except where the counterparty knows or should know that it exceeded its authority limits. Now, how will the legal rep know what his authority limits are? There are two ways. One, it will be in the articles of association of the company. But having said that, when I work with companies about their incorporation process, there is usually only one person I am talking to about the articles of association, meaning that nobody else within the corporate structure or even as a shareholder have read it. It's insane. So you want to make sure that when you're creating the articles of association of the Chinese company, that everyone has read and has a copy and has even signed off on a copy that they've read it to know what the authorities are for the shareholder, for the board of directors or executive director, legal rep, GM, and supervisor. All right. In addition to that, if any of these individuals um, have employment contracts, meaning they're physically employed by the entities, whether they're employed by the overseas entity, the shareholding company, or by the Chinese company, you want to make sure that their authority limits are also in their employment contracts. Okay. You want to protect yourself to the limit. You want to make sure that if they do breach the contract by, for example, signing off on a contract that is in excess of what they're allowed to sign off on, that that is a breach of contract and you are able to terminate without compensation. Okay, it is critical. So here are a couple of recommendations I have in terms of allocating powers to the legal rep. Generally speaking, most legal reps that my clients appoint are not physically based in China. Um, I would say about 90% are not physically based in China. They're physically based in the headquarters, which probably means that China is not their sole responsibility, which again means they're probably not dealing with day-to-day -day operations of the entity. So, you know, they could be or pretend to be um, clueless about a lot of things. You may also not want to have the general manager, the appointed general manager, be also the legal representative. You may want to split those two functions. If you have the ability to split it because you have a number of people that you can appoint in those roles, then do it. If you don't have that ability and you don't have the quantity of people needed, then don't do it. As I said, the first criteria should really be that anyone who's appointed has some form of knowledge about the China business and is some type of decision maker on the China business, okay? If you are appointing someone who is legal representative, their signature is probably only going to be needed about two or three times a year because on average, two or three times a year, you will want to change something within your entity structure or you will need this person to gain, to provide uh, approval at the bank, okay? But it's only two or three times a year. Documents can be emailed, printed out on their end, and then couriered over. Um, but keep that in mind. You want to also make sure that with any corporate structure rule, and I'm pinpointing this on the legal rep because I had this case study at the beginning, 
you want to have signed copies of signature sheets that are undated for security purposes. One of the reasons for this will be for termination purposes, but it could be that if, for example, the legal representative falls ill and is in hospital and has no ability to sign any document, that you at least have some signature sheets that are undated but signed that can be used as resolutions to do and operate your business, okay? Um, and again, I'm, I'm talking out of experience here. So make sure that those signature, signature, sheets, oh, signature sheets are available. Most people don't, I would say 98% of people don't like to sign blank pieces of paper. Fully understandable. So what you want to do is either keep those signature sheets with your general counsel in your home jurisdiction or keep it with a provider advisor in China, whether that be your lawyer, your accountant, your corporate service provider, whomever, okay, just so that they are not kept internally by people that can use them in bad faith. But by keeping them externally, you know that they are actually safe and sound. Now, another thing is allocating power to the general manager. Now, there are two points that I want to make about the general manager. The first is the general manager is not somebody, when you are appointing these people in the corporate structure in China, uh, like I mentioned earlier, nobody has to reside in China. And number two, they don't have to, they don't have to, um, um, uh, by not residing in China, it does not necessarily mean that they are not the general managers and they are the first level of directive in terms of dealing with the daily operations. Why? Now, most people, logically speaking, will say, well, whoever I point as the general manager on the ground in China, I will appoint as the GM because he's in China on his business card, it says general manager or managing director. So in the government system, I'll put his name as general manager. Now, remember, you are a startup in China. You have hired a general manager. What happens if you need to fire him? Then not only do you have to fire him and go through that tedious process, in many cases it's a nightmare process, but you also have to update the government system. And you need to make sure that he is okay signing off on everything, okay? So what I usually recommend to people is you can hire a GM on the ground, but it does not mean that this GM has to be appointed within the government system as the GM of the entity, okay? You want to be able to save cost in terms of professional fees in any way that you can. So try and do that right at the beginning. So um, don't appoint a general manager if you've only known them for less than a year. Um, especially with it, and what I mean by don't appoint the general manager, I mean that in the government system, okay, if you've only known them for less than a year. Um, don't give the general manager unrestricted access to the company chops. First of all, the chops need to be kept on the ground in China. So if you do have a general manager, make sure you have a internal operational guideline on how the chops should be used. You may also want to split the chops out so that maybe an external provider keeps some um, and then some are kept internal. Just keep in mind, whoever has the company chop has the ability to change their employment contract with just a simple chop on a new document. Okay, it is serious stuff here. So be aware of where the chops are being kept and how they're being uh, kept. You can limit the powers of the GM both in the Articles of Association and in the employment contract. You want to do that in both documents, okay? And make sure you par carefully plan who are the signatories on the bank account, who has access to the account, does the GM have access to the account, will they be the one operating the account? These are all questions you should be asking yourselves when thinking about the actual operations of the entity. So allocating power to use of the, of the company chops and seals is critical. Um, and you're probably wondering what the company chops are. When you incorporate a company in China, um, as part of the incorporation procedure, you have to apply for chops. And you get um, a minimum of four. So you will get the company chop, the legal rep chop, the finance chop, as well as the customs chop. There are two other chops which are generally used for larger organizations, which are the HR chop and the contract chop. Um, but for smaller organizations, those are not necessary. 
a company is bound whenever a contract or document is affixed with the company chop. Okay, so like I said, if you have a GM who has the chops on hand, he can take those chops, affix it to a contract, can be his own employment contract where he has amended his salary himself, and as a consequence, um, you know, he's he gets a higher salary and he has every right to do it, and it would be a valid contract. Um, so you've got to make sure, again, that the authorities of power in his employment contract, as well as um, in the Articles of Association, are very well defined. You may even want to have a internal operational um, guideline for senior managers, where specifically it outlines what they're allowed and not allowed to do, what are their powers of authority. So in that way, you have even three documents. Um, be very careful because... Chops can be forged. Um, there are very good forgers out on the market where they can take a company chop and forge it. There is always a way of detecting a forged chop. Um, I'm not a I'm not a risk auditor, so I can't detect it myself. Um, but it is actually possible. Uh, be wary of this. So whoever has it, you know, you want to make sure that they haven't forged it and have kept a set for themselves, right? So, as I mentioned, the role, um, so the, these are the chops. Now, generally speaking, you will have to appoint, not generally speaking, you will have to appoint a supervisor within your corporate structure. And the idea is understanding what that supervisor can and cannot do. So, um, the role of the supervisor is somebody that, I generally think of as somebody who would be a CFO or a finance manager for the main reason that they are there to make sure that the company is in compliance and that either the board of directors, executive director, legal rep GM are all doing things according to PRC law um, and that the entity in itself is in compliance. One of the main ways to indicate any forms of red flags uh, or warning signs are through your financial management reports and statements. So this is why I generally say appoint a CFO or a finance person into the supervisor role. As a consequence, you may want this individual whose main role is to supervise the entity and make sure it's compliant to then also hold the chops. But like I said, the supervisor doesn't have to be based in China. Um, they can be based abroad. If they are based abroad, they can't keep the chops. Um, they have to, these chops have to be kept on the ground. But just be aware, it's usually a recommendation of mine um, that, that I recommend this. If the chops are ever lost, you generally have to um, wait for a period of two to three months to get a new one because it has to be published. You need a police report. There's a couple of things that you have to do. So these are really, really important pieces um, that are utilized for your business in China. Now, problems can arise when a company wants to lay off anybody in the corporate structure. Um, and generally, that's the legal representative, but quite frankly, it could also be the executive director or the general manager. Um, now, the legal rep, the general manager, if they are based in China, they will normally control the legal rep chop as well as the company chop, which means that they could also be responsible to approve their own termination. So it is recommended that, that companies take precautionary measures to prevent any difficulties in this regard. Um, so I do know that a lot of companies, when they go through a termination of anyone that's in the corporate structure, they do have a lawyer by this, their side that helps them, helps them with the termination. If you have appointed a mainland Chinese person within these roles, it is a loss of face when they are terminated. To be honest, it's a loss of face for, for anybody when they're terminated. But for the Chinese, they do take it very personally. And in cases that I have personally uh, seen, they can overreact and can keep the chops and licenses and not give them back. So you do want to have someone on hand if you feel like that that's going to happen with the individual 
you might want to have a lawyer on hand to guide you um, and answer back because again a labor lawyer will know all the ins and outs of the labor law in terms of terminating someone in that role versus you so you might want to have that expert in the room with you as i mentioned one of the most reliable precautions and your lawyer will tell you this also is that you may want people in the corporate structure to sign undated termination letters or undated pieces of blank paper so that if you do want to terminate them you can so i was mentioning earlier about the role of the supervisor and that generally speaking the role my recommendation is usually that the supervisor should keep the chops um, but the main role of the supervisor is to supervise the execution of company duties by the directors and the senior management personnel um, from my perspective the only way really to do that is again to look through the financials you should have a supervisor who comes in and does internal audits and health checks every so often to make sure that all aspects and all departments of the business are properly supervised or are healthy um, and are, are, are in compliance. You know, there's, there's one situation once where a company went, um, a supervisor went in to do a health check. It was a complete surprise to the entity in China. He basically just showed up and started asking for documents from the meeting room. Um, and it was to his own discovery that a lot of the contracts with suppliers in China had been um, never renewed. There was not an updated contract. Um, there was nothing up to date about any of the supplier contracts whatsoever. Uh, and that had to be changed immediately. So you do want people to come in and supervise and make sure that everything is in compliance and up to date. So what strategies can you do to protect yourself, right? Well, as I mentioned, within the corporate structure, you definitely want to have the legal rep sign and chop undated termination letters or blank pieces of paper, but you do also want to do that for the executive director and GM. If you are the business owner yourself and you take on the responsibility be, to be in those roles, then you obviously don't have to do that. Um, you also should have a individual liability insurance for each of the people that are in the corporate structure as well as any other senior managers having this liability insurance will definitely protect you and help you and don't think of it as such a high cost it is a cost that is there to protect you okay the shareholders need to define very clear limits on the authority of the people within the corporate structure the legal rep, any of the senior officers, particularly those that are in operating, you know, they're, they're in the operation phase of the entity. But not only should you be coming up with clear limits of authority, what you really need to do is observe and monitor those procedures. You want to make sure that they are being implemented that people are following them. It's not just a matter of creating them, it's a matter of also then observing and monitoring them and make sh making sure that everybody is in compliance. And again, you can only find this out if you do go in and do health checks and do internal audits. Um, this, the, the fourth point that I wanna highlight in terms of protecting yourself is when you set up a company in China, most of the time the local government where you're establishing yourself will give a standard articles of association. Now, most companies that I meet with, they just want to use the standard form and they don't want to expand on it, which I think is one of the biggest mistakes that you can do. What you want to do when you get these articles of association, and even if you are an old China hand, review your articles of association to make sure that they are up to date review them at least once a year, okay? Read them to make sure that they are up to date with your operational guidelines, with your uh, limits on the authority. You wanna make sure that these documents are there, this document is there to be able to protect you, okay? You have the ability to expand on it, so please expand on it, okay? Don't just go with the standard that's being provided the, by the government, make sure you really read through it, expand on it, add all the limits on the authorities, etc. And the last point is really develop a chop control mechanism. So first of all, think very carefully 
about who is going to be holding the various chops. And second of all, make sure that whoever is holding those chops uses a logbook and delivers an updated logbook on a monthly basis so you know how the chops have been used. You can also be quite picky and say that anytime a chop is about to be used, do you want to have an approval process first? Um, out of efficiency reasons, that not, might not be the best thing. Um, and I say that particularly with the bank because you may want to do an overseas transfer. You get all the application forms from the bank, you use the necessary chops, and then when you go to the bank to deliver it, they start giving you further documents with, which need more chops. It just delays the whole process if you then have to get an approval process, okay? So you've also, you know, like I said, you've got to at some point give a bit of trust that people are going to use their common sense in terms of when they're going to use the chops. But by having this logbook, you have a clear, or your staff have a clear accountability in terms of how they're being used. Now, to end the presentation today a little bit, um, I highlighted it yesterday in quite a lot of depth, but what Woodburn Accountants and Advisors have done, we, is, we have devised a China roadmap for companies that are looking to grasp at opportunities in China, implement safe and compliant structures, and then grow the business exponentially. And each company has their own unique journey, but you know, ultimately the milestones and strategies are pretty much the same. When you're looking at, corp at, at developing the corporate structure within your entity, you've got to educate yourself on the risks, the liabilities, the responsibilities that each of these roles has, okay? And you want to make sure you are protecting yourself fully um, and that you are developing system processes to make sure that the entity in itself is protected, but also that you as a business owner, or if you are appointed in any of these roles, that you are also fully protected. So keep that in mind. The China roadmap can actually be utilized for anybody that is um, uh, looking to go into China. Even if you're a China hand, you will actually go through that flow and probably go back a couple of steps before moving forward again a few steps because your China journey is a journey. It's continuous and you always have to re-educate yourself on new laws and education. You should always be updating yourself on research um, issues and topics. Every year you should be updating your strategies and your budgets um, because there's a lot of turnover of foreigners in China particularly. You always want to develop your ecosystem and your network of individuals. Protection is the best form of, um, you've, just, you've got to protect yourself uh, and your business in China. You can only do that if you have system processes. You've got to analyze the numbers, look, make sure your numbers are correct, analyze them so that you can really then focus on your business. Now, what are the four ways that I can help you to be protected, particularly in terms of developing your corporate structure? The first one is advisory and education. Like I mentioned earlier, this, this client who's a business owner, um, she was appointed into these three roles and she called me with so much anxiety about taking on those three roles and what she could and could not do. And it was just a matter of talking her through it, calming her down and explaining to her what would be the advantages and disadvantages of, of her being in that role. So again, I'm happy to do that form of advisory. You need to set up managerial guidelines and procedures, something that we also are very much experienced with. We can also create a logbook for the various chops depending on where they're being allocated and control them on a monthly basis. In addition to that, one of the ways that you can work with me particularly is that I do act as a supervisor for companies um, who maybe don't even have the quantity of people they need. Uh, maybe it's really an entrepreneur, he's gonna act as executive director, GM, um, legal rep, and I then act as a supervisor helping to make sure that the company remains compliant. So in regards to developing the corporate structure um, and making sure that you have solid procedural guidelines, um, this is one way you can work with me. Now, if you found that interesting, please, by all means, book a strategy session with me. I'm gonna add the link into the chat box uh, here below. So um, set up a strategy meeting, happy to talk to you about what options you have in terms of appointing people. If you have already appointed people, then by all means, happy to talk about whether they're, they're the right people for your organization. So if you do wanna have a, a, a chat and talk, 
um, just click on the link and set up a meeting with me. Now, if you do have any questions, um, I am happy to answer them. Um, so, Theodora, thank you for replying. You're a newbie for China. Uh, what is the China Roadmap Program? The China Roadmap Program is basically a roadmap for your China journey. It's what you need to do, the steps that you need to follow um, in order to be able to be successful in the Chinese market. So if I would just go back on the slides to go back to the China Roadmap, um, you're basically looking at the first milestone, which is an opportunity. Is there an opportunity in China for your product, for your services? If there is, you need to first educate yourself on the market. You need to do research, whether that is pricing, benchmarking, um, market segmentation, brand awareness. I mean, they're all different types of research. You've got to figure out what research is applicable to you. You then have to, you know, if all of that is positive, you then have to create a strategy. You've got to create your business plan. You've got to create your budget. Um, the next step is implementation, right? You've got to first develop an ecosystem of people who are going to guide you. Um, you then have to develop forms of protection, whether that's registering your trademark, um, developing system processes, um, doing due diligences, etc. Then you've got to implement systems. You've got to have contracts. You've got to know how invoicing works. You've got to know how you're going to operate your HR. Um, and I just want to say this roadmap is applicable to companies that don't necessarily have entities in China. It's also applicable to those of you that are have an opportunity in China and are grasping that opportunity from your headquarter. So doing transactions from your headquarter. All of this still applies, okay? doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have an entity in China. And then, you know, what is everyone's focus? Everyone's focus should be on growth. Um, but in order to know if you're growing, you've got to make sure your numbers are correct. And that's the numbers from the HQ or the numbers from your China entity. You want to be able to analyze them, read them, understand what next steps can be so that you can then focus on the business and help it to grow. So that's the China roadmap that was developed um, by Woodburn Accountants and Advisors, which is a great step-by-step -step roadmap that people can follow to understand what they have to do when going into the market. Um, I hope I answered your question, Teodora. If any, Teodora is the only one that's been interacting with me. Um, so if anybody else would like to interact with me, now's your chance. Add in your questions um, into the chat section or question section of the control panel and I would be happy to answer them. As I mentioned, set up a meeting with me. If you're too shy to add it in the chat section, um, set up a meeting with me and I'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, just remember, if you do have entities in China or have an entity in China, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the audit and tax compliance requirements in China. As you can see the, from the title, it says start the process now because the deadlines are coming up very soon. So if you are a newbie, or sorry, if you're a startup in China and you don't know about this, um, and you were incorporated in 2019 from before probably November, um, then you have to go through this. So if you wanna know what those procedures are, what are those deadlines for 2020, then join tomorrow's session. And you can do that on our website at woodburnglobal.com slash event. Um, nobody else is interacting with me. What a pity. I hope those of you that aren't are booking sessions with me. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank everyone for joining me. Um, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Take care and goodbye.